The title of our study today is There's Something New. In the book of Ecclesiastes, the wisest man that ever lived said this, The thing that hath been, it is that which shall be. And that which is done is that which shall be done. And there is no new thing under the sun. Now we all know a wise guy that has become famous for saying this Bible quote. There's nothing new under the sun. Well, folks, I've got some new information that's just going to blow the lid off of this legendary quote. And it all starts with one of my songs, poems. And it goes like this. People are searching the world for something they can believe. But the things that they're trying are buying them nothing but grief. But when they call on his name and Jesus changes their song, all the love they can find is the kind that they've searched for so long. From where the desert winds blow to where the ocean is blue, everybody has seen everything. It seems that there's nothing that's new. But take a heart that's grown cold and take a soul black as night. Ain't it funny how they seem to change when they're brought to the light. And now, there is something new under the sun. Spelled different. Oh, it's spelled different, that's right. (laughs) Another lost soul has been won. Oh, what new joy they find. Oh, what peace of mind. Eternal life has begun. A soul that was sin sick and tossed has come to the foot of the cross. And much to the world's disdain, mercy's falling down like rain. One single drop, and it's done, folks. There is something new under the sun. (laughs) Thank you, M, for putting up with me. (laughs) Because it's that play on words that birthed this whole Bible study. Because there is something new under the sun. There's nothing new under the S-U-N, but there is something new under the S-O-N. Isn't it interesting that the world has rejected the S-O-N and gone after the S-U-N? Right? That's where the majority of the false religions of the world put their focus. And I'm sorry, I just couldn't resist the play on words and taking advantage of this opportunity in this title. Please forgive me. But one of the awesome Bible verses in God's holy word says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And so my study is about new stuff today. And it's just a simple little word study that we're going to go through. Those are actually kind of my favorite kind. But um, yeah, this new thing is not at all new, is it? There is no new thing under the sun. And this new thing, God's been doing it ever since this world's been here, right? right? He's been changing lives one after another all through the history of this world. But folks, if we are in Christ, and think about all these Bible studies we've been doing lately, because Jesus says, I in you and you in me, if we are in Christ and therefore he is in us, not just calling ourselves Christians, folks, but really in Christ, it says we are new creations. The old things are passed away, and the promise is, repeat this for me, all things are become new. So the very first Bible verse we look at in our our study today says that all things are become new, and I want you to remember that because it's going to come back before we finish our study today. 
Another verse that is very close to this one is found in Galatians 6.15. It says, For in Christ Jesus neither circumcision availeth anything nor uncircumcision, but a new creature. Again, a new creation. That's what it means. A new creature is a new creation. And there are details mentioned here. The circumcision, the uncircumcision. And let's face it, there are always details, aren't there? Right. Sure there are. Now, I'm not saying details aren't important. But the most important thing, got to have the horse before the cart, right? right? The really important thing is the new creation. Another very important Bible verse about this is found in Matthew 26, 28. For this is my blood of the New Testament. We get a New Testament, don't we? Right. Which is shed for many for the remission of sins. It all starts with Jesus. Amen? Amen. And it all starts with His blood. It is... A New Testament. It is for the remission of sins. And Hebrews chapter 9 tells us that without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of our sins. And that's what it's talking about here. So I hand-selected a few here. But now we're just going to go through the New Testament looking at the word new. And just see what we can find. It's not comprehensive. It's not every time. But it's the ones I picked out because I think they're cool. Remember, New Testament. We're already new, aren't we? All right. Luke 5, 37, 38. No man putteth new wine into old bottles, else the new wine will burst the bottles and be spilled, and the bottle shall perish. But new wine must be put into new bottles, and both are preserved. Jesus said that. Does it apply to me? Well, John 13, 34 says, A new commandment I give unto you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that ye also love one another. And this has always been fun to me because I do like the play on words. And there's a lot of that in the scriptures. And it's interesting, this same John talks four times in the New Testament about a new commandment. And it's really interesting stuff. What does it say? A new commandment I give you. Right? I know Jesus said it, but John wrote it down, right? In 1 John 2, verses 7 and 8, it says, Brethren, I write no new commandment unto you, but an old commandment which ye had from the beginning. The old commandment is the word which you have heard from the beginning. And in the very next verse, he says again, a new commandment I write unto you. A new commandment? Eh, it's not a new commandment. And then he says in verse 8, it's a new commandment. And then in 2 John 1 verse 5, it says, And now I beseech thee, lady, not as though I wrote a new commandment unto thee. So this same John, twice he says it's a new commandment, and twice he says it's not new. We know it's not new because there's no new thing under the sun, is there? But even though there's nothing new under the sun, do things appear new to us sometimes? Yes. Yeah. You know, praise the Lord, when I buy a, new, a, a, a different vehicle, <laughs> it's new to me. I learned my lesson in 1984. That's the one time I bought a new vehicle. And I learned my lesson. I haven't bought a new vehicle since then. I always get vehicles that are 5 to 10 years old. And I let somebody else pay all that depreciation. And the Lord has blessed me with some wonderful vehicles. I don't think I've hurt a bit. Okay? But they're new to me. Right? Every single time I do it. The last vehicle I bought was a GMC truck that was 15 years old. 15! new to me. So what is the Bible talking about when it talks about a new commandment? There's not a new commandment. It's a different way of looking at this thing. Right? 
And we know that the history of the church isn't pretty when it comes to God's commandments. They have not done as they should. They have not kept the Ten Commandments that well, have they? Yeah, they haven't even kept that one. That's right. So it's not really a new commandment. There's nothing new under the sun. But there is something about this that is described as being like new, isn't it? And so that should make us sit up and take note. In Romans 6, 4, it says, We are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in what? Newness of life. Newness of life. And so, folks, when we get baptized and join the church, there's something new there, isn't there? We should be, if you've been baptized, if you've joined the church, you should be walking in what Paul called newness of life. I'm not a show of hands, but are you? Amen. Are you? Is your life changed? Truly changed? Well, in 1 Corinthians 5, verse 7, it says, Purge out therefore the old leaven, that ye may be a new lump. That's what I feel like, is a new lump. <laughs> but look, a new lump doesn't sound that good. But look at this. That ye may be a new lump as ye are unleavened. For even Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Now this is very, very important stuff. The Passover lamb was served with unleavened bread and bitter herbs, right? And the lamb was a symbol of Jesus. What about the bread? It was a symbol of Jesus. He's the bread of life, right? And so that bread had to be unleavened because leaven in the Bible is a picture or a symbol of sin, right? And there was no sin in Jesus, and so there could be no sin in the emblems that represented the Lord Jesus Christ. And so did you catch what the Bible verse says about our becoming a new lump and why? Folks, it says that when we are made new creatures in Christ Jesus, we are unleavened. Am I making it up? It says it very plain. You become a new lump and you're unleavened. You know what that means? It means we are like Jesus. Right? He was the symbol. It had to be unleavened. And he says that he's going to make us a new lump. And that may sound a little funny to you, but I think new lump ought to be one of your proudest things. <laughs> right? Because when Jesus makes us a new lump, this being made, made new means that Jesus is taking the sin out of our lives. Amen? Amen. Amen. Isn't that exciting? You don't want to be an old lump anyway. Yeah, we don't want to be an old lump. We want to be a new lump. Well, just think about this, folks. We're to be made new by the Lord Jesus Christ. And He wants to take the sin out of your life. He promises to take the sin out of our life. And yet you talk to people, even devout Christians, that say, you know, we can't keep the commandments. We, you know... It's, it's always what we can't do. Well, folks, I don't find the Bible talking about what we can't do. The Bible talks about what we can do because I can do all through Christ which strengtheneth me and another one that's very close to it. With men it's impossible, but with God all things are possible. That ought to excite us, folks. He's not telling you you've got to do something. He's telling you you get to do something. He's telling you that if you're connected 
that thing of being in Christ and Christ in you, this is the way it's going to be. This is the way he operates in his people. All right, Ephesians chapter 4 verse 24 says, And that ye put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. I like that true holiness because there's a lot of things in this world that claim to be holy, right? right. There's a lot of things that maybe we think are holy. And I can't help but think about what we're talking about in Sabbath school class. God hath chosen the weak things of this world to confound the mighty. God has chosen the foolish things of this world to confound the wise. Well, how about this one? True holiness. That means there's a false holiness, doesn't it? And if we put on the new man, we're, we're created anew in righteousness and true holiness. So there's a new man, right? Colossians 3.10 is the same thing. And have put on the new man which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. There's that image. There's that character. There's the divine image, the divine character that is to be renewed in knowledge after the image of God himself. This one, though, it says put on the new man. That sounds kind of like putting on that robe of Christ's righteousness, doesn't it? We put on. And we know that it's the new man, but really and truly, who is the new man? Jesus. It's Christ. Amen. Think about it. We don't come into this world with Christ, right? We come into this world kicking and scratching and doing everything anti to that. But... <laughs> To put on the new man is to put on the Lord Jesus Christ. All right, Hebrews 8, verse 8. For finding fault with him, he said, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. So there you go. We have the promise of a new covenant, don't we? And that fits into the scheme of all these things we're talking about. Just two chapters later in Hebrews 10, 20, it says, By a new and living way which he hath consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say, his flesh. And those, that term, his flesh, is all about that image that we just talked about in the other Bible verse. But Jesus is all about bringing us a new and living way, isn't he? All right. Now, in Revelation chapter 2, verse 17, Jesus himself says, He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Who's speaking here? Jesus. <laughs> it's kind of interesting. The words say that the Spirit is speaking here. But then again, the red ink says that Jesus is speaking here. How do we reconcile those two things? It's not a problem. The Spirit is the Spirit of Christ, isn't it? Amen. It says, To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the hidden manna, and will give him a white stone, and in the stone a new name written, which no man knoweth, saving he that receiveth it. Now, We've talked about this a lot of times. What we've found out from the book of Revelation is that the name has a symbolic meaning to it. Do you know what the name of God represents? His character. His character. That's right. Praise the Lord. You guys aren't here that much. And you're answering the same answer. And that, that shows the same spirit. Amen? Beautiful. But it's the character that's being talked about here. You know, when you study in the book of Revelation about the seal of God, and we Seventh-day Adventists know that the seal of God has to do with the Sabbath, right? And the mark of, of the beast, consequently, has to do with Sunday. Sunday sacredness. Okay, 
But let's think about this. In the book of Revelation, when it talks about the seal of God, it says that the seal of God was written in their foreheads. Amen. And then another Bible verse comes along and says that the name of God was written in their foreheads. What is the seal of God? It's the name of God. Okay? Well, does that change the Sabbath? No. Why is the Sabbath the seal of God? Because it contains the name, doesn't it? And there's the connection. And it just keeps on happening. But here it says, I'll give him a stone in which there is a new name written, which no man knoweth, save he that receiveth it. In chapter 3, verse 12, it says, Him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God. This is Jesus talking again. And he shall go no more out, and I will write upon him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven from my God, and I will write upon him my new name. name. Whose new name? His new name. Jesus. Jesus' new name. Wow. So we have a new name. We have God's name written. We have Jesus' new name written. And all of these things are pointing us symbolically to the character. And again, I just heard you say it. Ellen White, talking about the seal of God, says it's a settling into the truth so that we cannot be shaken. If we settle into the truth, isn't that the character building? Absolutely. And so these things are just so beautiful to me. But we get a new name. We get his new name. Revelation 5 verse 9. And they sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof. For thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation. Who are we singing about in here? I mean, it's it's all about Jesus, isn't it? A new song. What is the song symbolic of? What did you say? Overcoming experience. Experience. And you're exactly right. Um, You know, it's the deliverance. But it's the experience of the deliverance. And only the ones that have the experience can sing the song, right? It's what the book of Revelation tells us. Again, Revelation 14, 3. They sung, as it were, a new song before the throne. All right? So we get a new song. What would a new song be? The old, old story. <laughs> well, it would be the old, old story because there's nothing new under the sun, right, Em? But a new song, if a song equals experience, what would a new song mean? A new song is a new experience, isn't it? Overcoming. Amen. That's exactly right. A new song is a new experience. And then in Revelation 21, it says, I saw a new heaven and a new earth. Are you looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth? Or do you like this one so much you'd just rather keep it? You know, you've seen these dumb game shows on TV where do you want to keep what you have or do you want to trade it in? We don't want this one. We want the new one that God has planned. And He's promised a new heavens and a new earth. And then in the very next Bible verse it says, and I, John, saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem. Jerusalem. So he's got a new city for us too. Right? right. All of these things are so wonderful. But it has to do with new, doesn't it? How many of you would agree while there's nothing new under the sun, God is all about new? Isn't he? Doesn't he want to upgrade us every chance he gets? Amen. I mean, it's just beautiful to me. Well, verse 5 brings us back to where we started. And he that sat upon the throne, who is that? It's the Father. Behold, I make all things new. 
Now, I got news for you. He doesn't sit alone on the throne. Amen. Jesus sits there with him. Yes, and not only that, when he makes all things new, he does it through Jesus, doesn't he? Amen. There's no there's no question there. But the Father's will is that all things are made new. Amen. And folks, isn't that where we started? Amen. Think about it. Revelation, the very almost the last page of the book says God's going to make all things new. And if back where we started, 2 Corinthians 5, 17. What is it? If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away, and behold, folks, all things are made new. Aren't they? That's the culmination of it. Where this starts, that's where it ends. Everything. You know, you think of the mortal put on immortal. You know what I mean? That's Absolutely. Where that complete transformation. Amen. You know... This is just the world I grew up in that makes me say this because it doesn't do it justice. But we used to say, you know, like I got a new truck. I was 15 years old. If I, got a, if I really got a new truck, we would have said it was brand new. Brand spanking new. Yeah, I was thinking that even though I didn't say it. <laughs> Folks, all of these things that's, that's being talked about are going to be brand spanking new, aren't they? Amen. 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 Even our vile bodies, when we when we are changed to our glorified state, I don't think there's one iota of the old me that's going to be kept. I think it is a new creation in Christ Jesus. Well, I want to share this quote with you before we close. The Lord, by close and pointed truths for these last days, is cleaving out a people from the world and purifying them unto himself. In our Sabbath school class this morning, the, the word was used, cleaving. But it was a completely different word used in a completely different way. It was talking about someone cleaving to someone else. All right? right. Do you know what this cleaving means? Cutting out or out? It's cutting out. It's like you take a meat cleaver, chop, chop, right? You take a piece out. So the Lord by close and pointed truths for these last days is cleaving out a people from the world and purifying them unto himself. She says pride and unhelpful fashions the love of display, the love of approbation, all must be left with the world if we would be renewed in knowledge after the image of Him who created us. By the transforming agency of His grace, and by the way, this is the book Amazing Grace, God's Amazing Grace, it says, by the transforming agency of His grace, the image of God is reproduced in the disciple. He becomes a new creature. The image of God. What is the image of God? It's the character of God. On the first pages of the Bible, it says that man was created in the image of God. And I do believe that that has somewhat to do with the way we look. In other words, you can read in the Bible, God has a face, God has a head, God has arms, hands, a right hand, God has legs, feet. It says all of that. Okay? But way more important than that is that we were created in God's character. Okay? And... That being the worst thing that was lost when Adam and Eve sinned, what's the very best thing that we stand to get back if we follow the plan of salvation? Isn't it His righteousness? Isn't it His character? So, that's what she means when she says, by the transforming agency of His grace, the image of God is reproduced in the disciple and he becomes a new creature because he didn't have that before, did he? He's a different creature. It says it is the Holy Spirit, the Comforter, 
which Jesus said he would send into the world that changes our character into the image of Christ. And when this is accomplished, we reflect, as in a mirror, the glory of the Lord. Praise his holy name. Amen. Folks, it's the spirit of Christ that changes our character into his. Amen. Amen. And into the Father's. And it says, into the image of Christ. The spirit comes in and we glow with, as it were, the glory of Christ, right? Amen. And we know right now that's not a bright light kind of glory, but it's the character, isn't it? Yes, he, he awesome, awesome stuff. Though, from a happy Christian that... There is a glow that goes along with this, and I also believe what the prophet says, that in the last days, when the latter rain begins to fall, there's going to be more of the literal stuff too. There really is. And I appreciate that and long for and look for that. Well, I end with this statement from the Holy Bible. Marvel not, folks, that Jesus said unto you, you must be born again. Amen? Amen. Amen? We must be born again. It's all about being something different than what we used to be. Being something new. A new creature in Christ Jesus. Amen? Amen. That's like a new birth, huh? And again, it comes back. I know that basically all of my Bible studies end the same way. Christ in you, the hope of glory. Right? The glory is the character. But folks, without Jesus living within, there's no chance for this to happen for us, right? Well, let's Sing this closing song, number 316, Jesus, live out thy life within me. 316.